through times of, uh, of uh, depression where it just seems the world is weighty. It seems like to take another breath is almost too much. Uh, it's hard to see light at the end of the tunnel. But knowing that God loves you in the middle of that is, uh, well, it's extraordinary. And so I've lived my life with all the ups and downs and... I've doubted myself, I've uh, doubted many things, but I have never doubted the love of God. And that's been a, a foundation, uh, something, a, a base, the rock on which I've built my life to know that God is real, that he really loves me, that Christ has paid for my sins, uh, that heaven has been opened up to me, and I will be with the Lord uh, for eternity. And that's beautiful. That's beautiful. And it doesn't depend on my goodness. It depends upon the goodness of the Lord. Uh, God saw me as a child, growing up, as an adult, with different struggles, with different hardships, not just external, but wars going on on the inside. And he's never stopped loving me or caring for me. The title of today's message is Beautiful, and it comes from the pen of Isaiah the prophet, whom the Apostle Paul later quotes, and it says, How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news. And you can imagine uh, an alien army maybe is coming, an invading army is coming, and there's this small alpine village, and they believe they're going to be overrun, and... and uh, but the enemy army is defeated. And then there's a runner, and he's just running to, get, to spread the good news. He comes out over the mountain, down into the valley, and the people are waiting, waiting, waiting. Good news. Your homes will not be destroyed. Your children will not be killed and enslaved. Good news. The enemy is gone. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who are bringing good news. Look at that guy. Look at, I think there's joy in his footsteps, not fear. He's, he's coming to bring us good news. Brothers and sisters, sometimes our lives are uh, so easy. Uh, maybe 2020 has helped fix that a little bit, but often uh, we, what we've said over the years is if you look at the totality of human existence, all the cultures across all the globe, throughout the generations, it's almost like we in the West, and particularly in the United States, have lived in this bubble that gives us a false sense of security. Uh, our, our life expectancy isn't that much more, but, but the, the trouble we have to face in having to face death itself is often a couple steps removed. The hospitals deal with that. The funeral homes deal with that. And, and uh, we don't have many of the hardships. We haven't had many of the hardships of starvation and disease and, and violence in the streets that has marked most of human existence. Uh, Things may be, I, I mean, I don't want to exaggerate, we've got it pretty good here. We've got it really good. But, but we're maybe getting a glimpse of how, how desperate things can be and how difficult the human condition has been. Most Christians throughout the ages have put their faith in the Lord with death being one failed harvest away, with tyrannical government ruling over them without a, a sense of a peace and security or, or, a, or a, a bank account. That's been the experience of most Christians, and yet they sang joyfully to the Lord, and they gathered together to worship the Lord. Pain is real. Physical, mental, emotional pain, all of these things are real. Sometimes there's horrific suffering in this world. Uh, I started a talk about human trafficking in my message, it got very dark very quick. Human trafficking, human trafficking is a global rot on our culture, on, on global society, and it's, it's right here in the United States as well. Young lives are ruined, drained of innocence, drained of hope for the future. Often these modern-day slaves actually, and this is stunning, only live a few years in slavery. Their life expectancies are so short because of the hardships they endure. Many of them are plied with drugs and they're, 
they die of drug overdoses because they can't do their dehumanizing work unless they're sedated or high. And other times death comes early because of cruelty or even hunger and abuse. Can somebody bring them good news? The one who climbs mountains to bring hurting people the message of new life in Christ is beautiful in God's eyes. The one who goes past societal difficulties, past personal hardship, past all the trouble that it would bring into their life to reach out to hurting people who act in hurtful ways, who are, who are numb to the world, and let them see that the love of God is real. Such a person is beautiful and wonderful in the Lord's eyes. The gospel, that's a religious word, the gospel, that God loves us despite anything that we've ever done, and that he sees our sins. He sees them. He sees the most vile, wicked, selfish, self-righteous, hard-headed thing we've ever done. He sees our sins, and he brings grace and forgiveness. He, the blood of Christ, the perfect blood of Christ is applied to our lives, and we are set free. He will forgive us if we turn to him in faith. There is nothing else like the gospel. You can watch a lot of movies. You can travel the world over and see a lot of cultures. You can read a lot of books about world history. You will not find anything else like the gospel. It's unique. The world can be cynical. Sometimes laughter, which should be like the merriment of heaven, an echo of the joy we have in the present Savior. But sometimes laughing is cruel. Ha! It's mocking. It's, it's, it's a mirth that shows something about the vileness of the laugher, right? Loved ones die too soon, and they're gone. And in this life, we will not see them again. We struggle in the workplace with our coworkers. We struggle with our friendships because they're just as fallen as we are. We struggle in our families, and we struggle with ourselves, and perhaps most of all, uh, although most human beings were really good at justifying any nasty attitude uh, by saying, well, it was justified. Uh, it, we, we are able to, to defend ourselves very well, and that's why if we're not walking in the Spirit, uh, we either don't see sin and we're numb to the sins of the world, or if we're, we've got a little bit of the Holy Spirit, we can see the vileness and the rottenness and the fallenness in the world around us and in our spouses, uh, but we don't see ourselves. But if we are humble and we're prayerful and we're saying, Lord God, please reveal uh, to me if there's any wicked way in me, then God begins to show us where we are fallen, where we fall short, where we need to work. We are weary and beat up, oftentimes by ourselves, and we are too old for childish fantasies, make-believe gods, and touchy-feely religion. I don't need that. You don't need that. Uh, why go to church if that's all we've got? If it's not real, please go away and leave me alone. I need to know if there's a God who loves me. If, there's, if, if it, we're just going to play make-believe, please go away. I'm an introvert anyways. <laughs> Go away and leave me alone. But if this is real, then it is real. It is worth everything. And I will surrender my life to this, and I will live my life for this, and I will learn to love God, and I will learn to uh, love other people the way God would have me, and I will try to live my life to make Jesus attractive to lost people. Because otherwise I'm wasting it. There is nothing else like the message of Jesus Christ, a message for all the world. This message of the love and forgiveness of God is for all people. Well, you mean the people that are riding the streets? Yes. God can't love them? Yes, he does. Jesus died for them. He, he would rather see them come to him with tears in their eyes saying, Lord God, please forgive. I want to follow you than to see them uh, beaten up or herded up and, and tossed in jail. The Lord loves and the Lord is drawing all people to him. There's nothing else like this. God 
It, we, we see a vision of heaven when the Bible tells us that all tribes will be there. All ethnicities, all languages will people heaven. Uh, imagine, uh, and we did this when, with, with my church in Japan. Uh, I'd say, we'll sing Amazing Grace, and we'd sing it in Japanese, and we'd sing it in English, and I'd say, now sing it in your own language. And we'd have multiple languages all at one time singing Amazing Grace or What a Friend We Have in Jesus. And it's beautiful. And maybe it's a little taste of what heaven would be like. All people together. Why? Because we're all sinners. We all need a Savior. All people together at the foot of the cross. There's no room for self-righteousness, feelings of superiority. There's, there's no smug sneer at the foot of the cross. There is no smug, self-righteous sneer at the foot of the cross. I need a Savior. I need somebody who will see me as I am and love me anyways. I need somebody to say, Dan, I see. Grab a hold of my hand. I will save you from yourself. I will save you from this mess. I need a Savior. And guess what? I know something about you already, even if we haven't even met. You need a Savior. You know you're a sinner. And God will forgive. If you surrender yourself, say, Lord, please forgive. Thank you for that cross where you died and paid the penalty for my sin. And this is beautiful. And God thinks it's beautiful when people share the gospel. God thinks it's beautiful when people receive the message of forgiveness. And it's beautiful when we take the grace and then walk in grace. And it's beautiful when we extend grace to other people. Well, not difficult people, Pastor Dan. Well, what is grace for if it's not for difficult people? We don't have to be graceful to the people who please us, who do things the way we want. Grace is for people like me and people like you. It's beautiful when a determined face to the wind, the tsunami of society is crashing against you, but you're single-minded and you're humble, and you're a person who points others to eternal life. Like one beggar, one homeless person, one street person sharing with another beggar where to find the best meal they've ever had. And not only does it taste good, it fills you up. And not only does it fill you up, it is nutritious. It revitalizes. It brings new life, one taste of this heavenly food in your life is on a different trajectory. Everything's changed when we meet Jesus Christ. I'm not a Christian because I'm so wonderful. I, don't, I didn't come to God riding on a white horse and say, you're lucky to have me. Uh, it, it sounds ridiculous to even say it. We come to God on our knees. And that's why we find other people who are also full of sin and struggling in this broken world. And in our brokenness, we say, I found a God who loves. I found a God who accepts me as I am, and he's changing me, and he's working on me, and he's showing me that his ways are better than my ways. Come with me. Let's go together, and we'll find love like nothing else. We will find forgiveness like nothing else, and purpose, and meaning, and life, real life, life abundant. The opposite mentality of the beggar showing another beggar where to find food is the old conquistador mentality. I'm all armored up. I've, I've got my pole arm. I've got my sword at my side. And you are going to repent or you are going to die. Repent. I don't have, I don't have time. I don't have trouble. I can't be troubled with people like you, messed up, small-minded, pathetic people. I am a child of God. Take my sword or take baptism. Your choice. Actually, I'd prefer you take the sword. Actually, sometimes the conquistadors would give them both. First, you got a chance to be baptized, and then they murdered you. I think they felt better about killing baptized people because it made them feel better about themselves, like they were, they were still murderous and, and self-interested thugs and greedy and power-hungry, and, uh, but at least they were religious. See, we can use religion to hammer other people. And what, what 
blasphemy to use the name of Jesus Christ to hammer other people and to build ourselves up by putting other people down. When we would rather hammer or humiliate those idiots on TV, hammer or humiliate the people at work we just can't stand, hammer or humiliate the people at school, we would rather destroy them than serve them, we are basically wannabe conquistadors, using religion to justify ourselves. Not only can we get nasty, but we can feel spiritual and righteous about it as we do. It feels good to be righteous and better than everybody else. Religion can be such a nasty, wicked tool, not the way God intended. Uh, if Pastor Dan allows himself to think, I'm here to bring truth. I have no time for people who can't stand the truth. Then Pastor Dan is wrong. Jesus has given me so much grace. He's forgiven such a debt. Should I leave the presence of God and grab somebody by a scruff, shove them up against the wall and say, pay up? You miserable wretch. I'm so sick of people like you. What right do I have? No right. My rights are gone. I have no rights because I've been bought by the blood of Jesus Christ, and I am here to love people. I'm here to make Christ attractive. I'm here to bring people close to the living God. Amen. God has had so much unmerited favor, grace, love, patience with me, how can I turn around, deny that same grace to other people, and act like I am the wrath of God incarnate? What's your spiritual gift? I'm kind of like the wrath of God. I can be real hard on people. Remember our quote from the church father origin last week? If somebody has a love for God, a zeal for God, but does not know does not know that love must be patient, kind, not envious, not acting wrongly, not puffed up, not ambitious, not seeking its own, and so on, Origen writes. If he does not have these things in his love, but only loves God in his emotions, then it may be rightly said of him that he has a love for God, but not according to knowledge. Or remember how we learned to read 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the love chapter. A lot of people know it. If you've been to a, a wedding, you've heard 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And one of the things that I've, I've tried to teach us to do is to put our own name into the scriptures. Read the scriptures with our own name in there. So 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4, 5, and 6. Put your own name in there. It says, love is patient. Love is kind. So I would put my, how am I doing? Dan is patient. Oh my goodness. I'm already convicted. Love is kind. I've got a lot of work to do. Put your name in there. Don't put Dan's name in there because I'm not going to measure up. I know it and you know it. Put your own name in there. Love does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. How do you know you're proud? Well, when somebody treats you like a servant and it irritates you. It does not dishonor others. If we're able to go through this list and not be convicted, we, the Holy Spirit, <laughs> please. It is not self-seeking. It's kind of the American way, isn't it? It is not easily angered. The wrong thing for me to do right now is say, well, yeah, that's, what, that's the ideal. That's not me. That's not who I am. The right thing to do is say, yes, God, this is you. And your ways are beautiful and better than my ways. Help me, Lord. I want to repent. Keep reminding me of these things. Pre keep calling me back to the right path. Love keeps no record of wrongs. So, men, women, burn that list of wrongs that you keep track of about your spouse 
that you keep ready for every argument, or your friends, or your boss. It's good to have a bad memory, otherwise we get bitter. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, it always trusts, always hopes. Love perseveres. Well, okay, God. I heard you right now. I'm going to need to hear it again in a couple minutes. When this is not me, I must repent. Repent is not a bad word. Repentance is part of the everyday Christian life. The Holy Spirit reveals to us where we, oh, bad thought, bad attitude, oop, self-righteous, and we, we confess it. Lord God, I confess I've been self-righteous. I've been hard-headed. And then we breathe in the grace. We exhale our sins. We breathe in the grace. Repentance should be a regular part of Christian life. If it's been a while since we repented, we're doing it wrong. James 4, 8 says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your, heart, your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Remember the words of Christ. And it's kind of funny because I said, remember the words of Christ. Remember when you read them, but they haven't been said yet because they're from the future. Uh, remember the words of Christ in Revelation chapter 3, although they were said to the guy who revealed them about, uh, anyways, going on. Uh, Revelation chapter 3, he's talking to the, these different churches in, in uh, Asia Minor that represent different attitudes and characteristics of churches that have been true ever since then. And he's speaking to the church in Laodicea. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. So be earnest and repent. God loves his children, so be earnest and repent. Repentance is beautiful. Hard-headedness is ugly. Repentance is beautiful. To be unrepentant is ugly. And then Acts 3.19, a verse that we often quote here at Foundation. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. And refreshing is a good thing. Holy Spirit refreshing where I'm no longer tied up in a knot inside because I've come clean. I say, oh, Lord, I, for, I, I surrender. I surrender to you, Lord. Uh, please fill me up with your goodness. I want to be back on track. Repentance is, is beautiful. It brings joy to God, and it brings joy to us. Sin is always wrong, but sin actually gives us an opportunity to bring a victory for the Lord because sin gives us the opportunity to please God when we turn from it. Put it in the rearview mirror. Uh, all of us in this room are thinking of different sins right now. Uh, we all have different things we need to turn from. Turn from these sins, put them in the rearview mirror, and that pleases God, and it's beautiful. We are here to be, uh, you know what? It's good that you don't just read your notes like a robot. If I had handed my notes to, to John Cook today, he would have just said, we are here to be soul sinners, disciples, bringers of mercy. But that would be wrong. We are here to be soul winners, disciples, bringers of mercy, peacemakers. We can't let our flesh get in the way. The stakes are too high. We can't let old Satan play us. We can't buy what he's selling. The Apostle Paul knew how to cross mountains and, and sail over rough waters and face all sorts of self-deprivation and unfair treatment at the hands of shallow and cruel people. Have you ever noticed that some of the cruelest people are also very shallow? The, the, the waters don't run deep. Shallow, cruel people. He yearns for the divided Christians in Rome to come together, to be united, to share his heart, to share the gospel. He, his heart is to bring the gospel to all peoples, and he wants to get the Roman church on fire for that. Listen to what he tells the Roman believers. And uh, remember that if we were alive a couple thousand years ago and heard the book of the Romans read to us for the first time, because people didn't have Bibles in their homes at that time. And so Paul wrote the book of Romans. It was sent uh, in, in the Roman church, got a hold of this. And he said, I've, this is a church he did not found. 
He hadn't been there yet. So he wrote them this letter to share with them his heart, and it was meant to be read all at one setting. Well, I'm going to read a lot today, and, and I'm uh, just going to grab chunks in, in, in order of the way it was written, but I'm going to obviously be skipping most of it because we're going to look at the first 10 chapters today. It's kind of a recap to where we're at. Now listen, it was meant to be read. I believe there's power in the reading of Scripture, but it's going to be on you to pay attention because... Your mama read you stories when you were little that made you go to sleep. No, we're not going to blame this on wonderful moms. This is on you. You're an adult now. You're bigger now. Uh, listen to the reading of Scripture and stay focused with it. Pay attention uh, because there are blessings that you will not have if you let your mind drift. Uh, the Scriptures are beautiful. And we're going to be reading portions of this letter. The onus is on you to pay attention, receive the blessing that comes, and... Uh, and then we'll talk about that. Well, I might break in a few times as we go, but I just want you to listen to the flow of this. Listen to Paul's heart. This is the gospel. This is his desire for the Roman church to get these things and God's desire for us to get these things as well. So Paul says, I am obligated both to Greeks and to non-Greeks, both to the wise and the foolish, that is why I am so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are also in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. You therefore have no excuse, you who pass judgment on someone else, for at whatever point you judge another, you are condemning yourself. Because you who pass judgment do the same thing. Now we know that God's judgment against those who do such things is based on truth. So when you, a mere human being, pass judgment on them and yet do the same things, do you think you will escape God's judgment? Or do you show contempt for the riches of His kindness, forbearance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? But because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath when His righteous judgment will be revealed. God will repay each person according to what they have done. To those who by persistence in doing good see glory and honor and immortality, He will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking, who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. There will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil, first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. But glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, first for the Jew and then for the Gentile. For God does not show favoritism. Now, we know that Whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ, to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of His blood to be received by faith. What does the Scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now, to the one who works, wages are not credited as a gift, but as an obligation. However, to the one who does not work, but trusts God, who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited to them as righteousness. David says the same thing when he speaks of the blessedness of the one to whom God credits righteousness apart from the works, quote, Blessed are those whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the 
one who sin the Lord will never count against them, end quote. Therefore, the promise comes by faith, so that it may be by grace and it may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring, not only to those who are of the law, but also those who have the faith of Abraham. He is the father of us all. As it is written, quote, I have made you a father of many nations, end quote. He is our father in the sight of God in whom he believed. The God who gives life to the dead and calls into being things that were not. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings. Because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame. Because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, whom has been given to us. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I find this law at work. <coughs> Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God, who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature a slave to the law of sin. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Jesus Christ, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by Him we cry, Abba, Father. That's Aramaic for Papa. Papa, Father. The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may share in his glory. I consider that our present sufferings are not worthy, are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. We know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? No. Now keep in mind, real quick, that Christians and believers in God have always been judged for their faith. Charges will be brought against God's people, but they will not stand in the heavenly court. There is no charge that will stick. The glove does not fit. We cannot be judged because the judge, the Father, has already pardoned us. Uh, he who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he also 
not also along with him graciously give us all things. Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, who died more than that, was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor the powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I speak the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience confirms it through the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow in unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my people, those of my own race, the people of Israel. There's the adoption to sonship. There's the divine glory, the covenants, the receiving of law, the temple worship, and the promises. There's are the patriarchs, and from them is traced the human ancestry of the Messiah, who is God over all, forever praised. Amen. Brothers and sisters, my heart's desire in prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. For I can testify about them that they are zealous for God, but their zeal is not based on knowledge. Since they did not know the righteousness of God and sought to establish their own righteousness, they did not submit to God's righteousness. Christ is the culmination of the law so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. It is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As the scriptures says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. For there's no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone, quote, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. And Paul's feet carried him mile after mile all over the Mediterranean world, preaching, teaching, winning souls, making disciples, and planting churches. And today, all of us who love Christ, all of us whose hearts have been captured by the love of God, we are the spiritual descendants of those first churches that were planted by Paul and the other apostles in this very first generation of, of believers. It's a beautiful message. It leads to a beautiful life with a beautiful Savior. Paul got it. Paul got it. How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. And this comes, again, like I said, from the pen of the prophet Isaiah. Good news is always good. But sometimes it's even better. And it's kind of paradoxical. Because the good news is best when we're in agony. The good news is best when we're dying and we wake up in heaven. The good news is best when we had no hope. Think about that for a moment. No hope. And suddenly, all our hopes are real in front of us. Good news is always good, 
It's about when people are afraid, when people are beat up and wounded, so they look in the mirror and they look like their only wounds. Good news, unexpected good news, is life itself. Do you know anyone who is living in fear? Do you know anybody who is living with a lot of anxiety? Maybe they're afraid of the COVID virus. Or they're bound by unforgiveness. Something has happened in their past that's so horrible they can't speak of it and it's just been a drag and a chain on their entire life. Do you know somebody battered and bruised, anxious, living in fear? Do not despise that person. Do not despise the weak. Do not despise the cowardly. Do not despise the person who is fearful. The person who is worried about what's going to happen next. Bring them beautiful words of life. Be the messenger that crosses the mountain to let them know that Christ has won the victory for them on the cross. If you do that, if you're the one who brings the words of life instead of the words of condemnation, you will be beautiful in God's eyes. Do you know nobody living in fear? Bring them words of life and peace and blessing, and you will be beautiful in God's eyes. I want to end now by reading more scripture. We are Foundation Bible Church for a reason. We always read a lot of scripture. Today was more than usual. I want to read now from Isaiah, and we're going to read the entire chapter 52. You can turn there if you like. And this message was given from God to the people of Jerusalem in the midst of massive change, unrest, societal collapse, this was a message of hope to hopeless people. And by the way, it was also a message that the Messiah was coming. The Savior was coming. Awake, awake, O Zion. Clothe yourself with strength. Put, your garment, put on your garments of splendor. O Jerusalem, the holy city, the uncircumcised and defiled will not enter you again. Shake off your dust. Rise up. Sit enthroned, O Jerusalem. Free yourself from the chains on your neck, O captive daughter of Zion. For this is what the Lord says. You were sold for nothing, and without money you will be redeemed. For this is what the sovereign Lord says. At first my people went down to live in Egypt. Lately Assyria has oppressed them. And now what do I have here, declares the Lord. For my people have been taken away for nothing, and those who rule them mock them, declares the Lord. And all day long, my name is constantly blasphemed. Therefore, my people will know my name. Therefore, in that day, they will know that it is I who foretold it. Yes, it is I. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, your God reigns. Listen, your watchmen lift up their voices. Together they shout for joy. When the Lord returns to Zion, they will see it with their own eyes. Burst into songs of joy together, you ruins of Jerusalem. For the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. Think of that phraseology uh, in our own context. You heap of ruins. You're not what you should be. Burst into joy. God has redeemed you. The Lord will lay bare His holy arm in the sight of all the nations and the ends of the earth will see the salvation of our God. And of course, this is true in Christ. Depart, depart, go out from there, touch no unclean thing. Leave the culture, leave the vileness of our culture behind. Come out from it and be pure, you who carry the vessels of the Lord. But you will not leave in haste nor go in flight, for the Lord will go before you. Lord's in front, 
The God of Israel will be your rear guide. The Lord's behind you. He's on all sides of you, defending you. See, my servant, we're talking about Christ again, will act wisely. He will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. Just as there are many who are appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any man and his form marred beyond human likeness, so he will sprinkle many nations with his blood. The kings will shut their mouths because of him. For what they were not told, they will see. And what they have not heard, they will understand. That's the message of God going to the Gentiles. This is beautiful. This is beautiful. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saves a wretch like me. Let's pray. Dear Lord God, We accept your forgiveness. We accept the grace. We accept the blood of Christ poured out on the cross to cover our sins so that we could have new life. Lord God, here we are. Please let us be beautiful in your sight. Let us hold Christ to your beautiful Son. Let us hold tight to your beautiful Son, Christ. Let us walk in the beauty of this life you've given us. And let us, Lord God, bring peace and the message of salvation to people who are living in ruins, who are afraid, who have been beaten by this world and beaten by their own sins, Lord. We want to be beautiful in your sight as we bring this message of hope to the hopeless. God, thank you for being such a good God. Thank you for bringing us here together at Foundation Bible Church so we could encourage one another. And thank you, Lord, for this Bible that we could read and study today. I pray, Lord, that your word would go deep down into our hearts, that we wouldn't contemplate these things just for a, a few minutes on Sunday morning, but, Lord, your scriptures would become a part of who we are, Lord. Father, please give us opportunities this week to tell people about your son Jesus and to bring him to church. We ask these things in your name, Lord. Thank you. Amen. Hello. My name is John Cook. I'm on the leadership team at Foundation Bible Church. We're so glad you could join us today. We strongly believe that every one of Jesus' followers should be connected to a local church and giving joyfully and regularly to support the ministry of that church. If, however, you would like to partner with us at Foundation, in addition to your regular local giving, we would appreciate having your prayers and support. If you're watching on YouTube, there's information about giving below. You can send a check to P.O. Box 347, Janesville, Wisconsin, 53547. You can also give online through PayPal at foundationbiblechurch.com. Thank you. God bless.